you say, what in the world is a hashtag? Be honest. It's fine. Okay, so we're all pretty caught up on hashtags. So social media at the end sometimes of a post, a hashtag is something you can just kind of, you can put in there and it kind of categorizes your post. So, um, you know, hashtag running late. So you're running, uh, today I got, you know, spilled coffee on my pants, hashtag running late. And what you do is you can click on that hashtag and it brings to everybody else who had that hashtag. It kind of just you know, you can find all the related posts and things like that. So it's used a lot on, on social media, a lot of these different hashtags. And, and it's really these kind of the big idea that you're trying to pose for your, for your post, the, the, um, uh, what you're trying to say. You're trying to get noticed for things. You'll put, you know, your, your hashtags. Uh, click on the hashtag. Um, what I've realized is, though, that real life a lot of times doesn't look exactly like social media. Who would agree with that? Everyone has their best on. Everyone looks perfect. And in that same thought, real life can't be summed up as easily in a simple hashtag. So we are kind of looking over some of the popular hashtags over, the, over these few weeks and just saying, hey, what does that look like in real life? Uh, what, what, what does that hashtag kind of, how does that play out? Um, we're looking at the way different people use them. And this week, we're looking at hashtag no filter. Anybody seen that on Facebook or, or Instagram or something like that? Hashtag no filter. Okay, so here's, here's the kind of setup. On Snapchat and Instagram and all these, there's these things called filters. So you take a picture, and then you can overlay different things on top of that picture to change the way the picture looks. Uh, and then if, if you're analog and you're like, I don't know about that digital, it, it actually existed before Facebook, but it was these little lenses that you would snap on the end of a camera. I know, weird, you know, like physical things, uh, you know, but it would snap on and you would change the filter of what the color of, of the picture would look like, red, green, blue, whatever filter that you would put on there. And so now we, we have filters made through algorithms and all this kind of stuff on the digital format, but you can kind of change the way that a picture, uh, that a picture looks um, just by kind of simply clicking through a few um, buttons. We can make pictures look more interesting. You can make yourself look skinnier. You can make yourself look taller. You can make yourself look like a butterfly. I mean, you can do all kinds of stuff, some weird filters on this uh, Instagram, Snapchat, all this. And, and, and um, I have a few examples. So here's the first one that I found during like the uh, presidential debate. Somebody, I guess, took a screenshot of the debate and added a little filter to it, I guess, to make it uh, more interesting. All right, so that's, that's fun. Go to the next one. Yeah, so you have some that's like just changes from normal, makes you, I guess, look a little more polished, you know. Uh, go to the next one. And here's this beautiful sunset, and that they have some kind of like filter on. Don't do the last one yet. They put like a filter to make the sunset, I guess, look uh, more beautiful. So they have these different filters in that they, you filtered the pictures uh, through. But here's the funny thing. Now, I know this is going to shock you. It's a big deal. Like, you would never believe this. But people lie on Facebook, they don't always tell the truth on Instagram. Because there's this hashtag that's out. When you see something that's just especially beautiful, you just take a picture of it, just a raw picture, and say, this didn't even need anything added to. It's already so beautiful. Hashtag no filter. Well, people can be liars. And there are people out there, and I hope it's not you, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out. People will take pictures... They'll, they'll, they'll upload it, and they'll put hashtag no filter when in reality, there's a filter. Now, not a big deal if your integrity is worth a filter, but uh, people are like, because when they're trying to change their reality, they want their reality to look better than what it really is. So, I look this good, hashtag no filter. Well, I found a website, and it's called filterfaker.com. So watch out. So you can download these, these photos if you think, nah, it's not that good, or they don't. Yeah, sorry, but they didn't. That's not, that's a filter. Um, and you want to upload it to this website, it'll tell you if there's a filter and what filter they used. So watch out. 
Because people will lie, like this next photo here. That one is on that website. I mean, who would say a sunset is probably already beautiful in itself? God did a pretty good job with a sunset. It's like, but so they, they, they said, you know, watching the sunset, hashtag no filter. I mean, that's already pretty great. There's a filter on it. Like, well, why even lie about that? Why would you lie? So, because that was one of the, on, the, on the front page of that website right now. It's like, and it says faker all across, across it. It's like, and, and so, so they said no filter, but in reality, there, there actually is. Why do people do that? Why would people try to say there's no filter. There's another one that I saw, and it's, it's, it's of, a, of a lady, and I didn't want to show it because I didn't want to like, make fun of people, but she, she's all, all dolled up, and it said, um, the, the real, uh, real-life Barbie doll. By the way, if someone else calls you a real-life Barbie doll, that's okay. You call yourself a real-life Barbie doll? A little cocky, but I'm just saying. So she, she took a picture of it, and then she said, real-life Barbie doll, hashtag no filter. Like, this is just how it looked. And it was on that website, too. And it was like showed all these filters that was added. <laughs> it's like, because why do we do this? Why, why would we, we want to create a different reality? Because we want there to be this appearance that my reality is better than how I see that it actually is. And, and I think we all do it on some level. And not that it's always bad. I'm not saying if you go, you take a picture and you put a filter on it and make it, you know, sepia tone or black and white that you're evil and going to hell. I'm not saying that. Okay? What, 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 what I'm saying is that some people were so dissatisfied with their own reality that we try to filter in any way that we can to make it look a little bit better. But there's, there's, some, good, there's some good times. Think about it. Job interview. You're not going to talk about all the horrible things that you did. You're going you're gonna to like, this is my best. I'm going to you know, look the best and be the best that I can. They ask you what's your greatest weakness, and my only weakness is that um, I can't really rein in all my strengths. You know, it's like, can we say stuff like that? You know? Or your very first date, you're going to kind of filter yourself a little bit, and you're not going to you know, fully burp and all that, are you ladies? I mean, you're going to wait till like the third date. And so, so some of that is good, but... We can sometimes in life be so desperate to be something that we're not that in the process that we sacrifice who we are. Trying to be something that you were never created or made to be, never happy. There always seems to be this struggle to be something else because if we step back, we step back and we think about it and we look at our own lives, it's easy to look at us in the mirror and say, because who I am just isn't quite good enough. What I have to offer isn't quite enough. And here's the big problem. The big problem with this is if I'm not enough, then I'll never be enough. If today I don't look at myself as worth having worth and value and I'm enough, then nothing that I do will ever be enough. If I looked like the filter that I put on there, honestly, I still wouldn't be happy. I'd still add something else. If all the stories that I told about my life were actually true, I still wouldn't be happy. If all the things were gone that I try to cover up, we would still need more. See, many people, a lot of people, we can, we can look at others and find the best. Or we can look past flaws. We can forgive missteps. We can look at others and forgive them and, and, and tell them, no, you don't look fat in those jeans. And a lot of times we really do mean it. But we look at ourselves and we see everything wrong. A, a lot of our problem is with us. A lot of our problem in life is with us. See, because living in a world of Photoshop and filters, being the unedited version of me can sometimes honestly seem pretty disappointing. I just, I just can't, I can't live up to these standards that, I've, that maybe culture has put out there that I've put on to myself. But we'll see in just a second, there's incredible power in a hashtag no filter life. In a life where I can be who God has created me to be. There's such power in that. I want to look at a story in the Old Testament where we see 
where somebody kind of dealt with the same situation, and they had to choose. Will I try and walk in and be something that I'm not, or will I find confidence in who God has created me to be? And it'll change the reality in the situation that you live in every day. So we've heard of this guy probably, whether you've been in church or not, you've probably heard of a guy named David. You know, you got sculptures of David, you got in the book of Psalms, you've got majority of those Psalms written by David. Well, we, we see that um, David, we, one of the greatest stories about David that we've all heard is the story about David and Goliath. And he, here's kind of the setup to this story. If you don't know it, if you do know it, I'm going to tell it anyways and just be happy and go along with it. So David is a shepherd boy, glamorous job, hanging out with stinky sheep all day long. He's the youngest uh, in his family. Um, he is um, um, the, the, the smallest in his family. And we see this story where he had defeats this, this Philistine champion, which is a rival army. Massive dude. said about nine foot tall. Just incredible stature. Not a normal guy. It's not like he just went up to another warrior as a shepherd boy and beat him, which would already be impressive. But he beat, like, Braveheart with three extra feet. I mean, that's, you know, that's who he's against here. And, and this is an incredible story of just, we, we love this story. It's a story of an underdog and, and all this that happened. And uh, what, what the context of it, he's, he was taking care of the sheep. He was still back at home with, with his dad, uh, living, living, um, living at home. And his brothers were out on the battlefield. They were old enough to be, to be fighting in the army. And so his dad tells him, hey, take a break from the sheep. Take this food and go bring it to your brothers out on the battlefield. So he does. He takes this and goes out there and, uh, and delivers the food to his, his, his brothers. And so the context going on is they're going against the Philistines, and um, they have this great idea between the two is, Here, here's how we're going to figure out who wins. We're just going to take our best soldier, your, our best warrior, and your best warrior. We're going to put them together. And whoever, they'll fight to the death, and whoever wins, that whole army wins. And the other army will be the other people's servants. So um, that's putting a lot of pressure on one guy. And there, you know, I'm sure the Israelites are like, yeah, we got this. That's cool. And then out walks this nine-foot guy with armor that weighed as much as their biggest dude. And so we see them as David walks up. They're all scared to death, and for days Goliath has been coming out and chanting and making fun of them, sending somebody out, making fun of their God, and it's just, um, it's not a good scene. They're like, what in the world are we going to do? What do we do next? We've got nobody that can even compete against this guy. David walks in, and we, we know the end story, so it's not like I'm going to ruin a surprise for you. Um, it's, it's a story of the runt who beat the champ, but how in the world did he even have the courage and the confidence to stand out there in that battlefield with this guy. So let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we kind of pick up as David, David walks out onto this um, battlefield um, with all this is going on. So 1 Samuel 17, verse 24, it says this. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright, saw saw Goliath. They began to run away in fright. Have you seen this giant, the man asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. Okay, reward. I'm listening. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife. All right, pretty good. And the man's entire family will be exempt from paying taxes. Woo! It's like, okay, this is getting, this is getting a good reward. Still couldn't get anybody. Nobody could would go out there. Because what's the point of all that if you're dead, right? David asked the soldiers that are standing nearby, what, what, wait, what will a man get for killing the Philistine and ending this defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyways that he's allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that's the reward for killing him. He's thinking, all right, sounds pretty good. I'll take care of sheep all day. It's not bad. But when David's oldest brother... Eliab heard David talking to the men. He was angry. He said, what are you doing around here anyways, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and your deceit. You just wanted to see the battle. And then as younger brother style, what have I done now? 
David replied. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others, and just like a younger brother, asked the same thing again and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to the king that he was asking around about what's, what, what the prize is, and he's kind of, this kid has some confidence, and the king sent for him. Verse 32 says this, don't worry about this Philistine. I mean, imagine there's a boy, possibly 15-year-old teenager around that age walking into the king's tent and saying, don't worry about it, I got it. You know, I would look at my, my nephews and say, you can't even remember to brush your teeth. Are they here? Oh, they're back there. Yeah, much less am I going to put the whole stake of this whole country in your hands. Yeah, hashtag no. Not going to happen. Not going to work. He said, I'll go fight him. And then Saul said kind of what I would say. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. He said, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. I would say, lay the lamb. I'm, you're gone. And it says, uh, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Uh, I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. I'm sure he's like, well, I mean, nobody else is in line. I mean, so we're going to do something. All right, go ahead, he said, and the Lord be with you. Hashtag, oh, man. Verse 38, then Saul said to David, then Saul gave David, big Saul, King, King Saul, that had the best of the best. He said he was tall in stature, big dude, gave David his own armor. What an honor, huh? A bronze helmet, a coat of mail, a little chain, chain vest. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. So tried to, tried to put the original filter on him. He said, hey, let me put this, this filter, this armor filter on you, right? Let me put this on you. This will make you at least appear to be a soldier. Maybe the guy will trip and fall on his own sword. I don't know, but it'll make you look a little better. It Maybe it's at least going to cover up the parts of you that's lacking, your lack of experience, your lack of size. If you go out in this armor, you're going to at least look the part, and we're not going to look so ridiculous. Be something you're not, because what you are isn't quite good enough. So Saul says, hey, take this and put it on. Hashtag armor up. Hashtag we're all doomed. That was kind of, that was his, social, that was his, that was his uh, Instagram post. He took a picture of David, and he's like, oh. And then David tries to take a step in it and can't. Doesn't fit him too big. He said, I've never worn this before. He's just inexperienced in it, whatever the case was at that point. He takes it back off. He says, I'm not going to go with this. I know who I am. Hashtag no filter. Hashtag you're too big anyways. Hashtag it's kind of stinky because you've been wearing it, and you're kind of a big dude, and it's hot out here. I mean, that's just, that's, that's kind of my version. But he's not going to wear this. And uh, he said, you know, no, who I am and what I can do is good enough. I don't need to put something else on. Because David, in this moment, understands something that we have to. And as we live life, as we face troubles, as we face our own giants and we go through life, he realized something that we have to get, that we have to get this inside of us. It's only when you embrace who you're made to be can you become who you're destined to be. It's only when you embrace who I am, who I'm made to be, can I actually become who it is that God's destined me to be. I'm never going to be who it is that God's destined me to be if I'm trying to be something else right now today. And David understood that. He would never even been able to walk out on the battlefield, much less win, trying to be something that he wasn't. Something other than a shepherd boy. Something other than what he knows. Something other than who he is. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 40 says this. So he just passes up on the armor. I'm sure Saul's like, 
All right, guys, this is really it. Everybody, go ahead and say your prayers. Uh, we're doomed. I mean, this is all over. And then, I mean, they got me really nervous whenever he walks over in verse 40. He says, he picked up five smooth stones. I'm like, what's he going to do with that? This guy's huge, and you're going to have a rock. You have a pebble. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with a shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. I'm sure that the rest of the Israelite army had complete confidence. I'm sure they were like, yeah, we've got this. We sent our best soldier, a 15-year-old with a slingshot. You're going down, Goliath. Now, I'm sure that the, the mood probably wasn't that good, but the difference is, no matter what anybody else thought, David said, I know who I am, and I know what I've got to do, and it's not going to stop me, no matter what you think about who I am. Because this is me, and there's a destiny on my life, because before this, he had already been, been anointed to be king. And he's like, I know this is my downfall today, because I still haven't been king yet. So I'm going to go forward and be who God has called me to be, so that I can do what God wants me to do. So he went out in complete confidence, and I, I think he did, in that moment, in this scripture, we can see kind of clearly about three things and, and that, that we struggle with and that he embraced. One is he embraced his past. He, he saw the struggles from his past. You know, most of us would have been like, I'm done with the shepherding stuff. I mean, I got tried to kill by a bear and a lion. I'm done. But, but David said, no, I saw the struggle didn't run away from it, learn from it, I'm better from it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a shepherd in my, David, in my, my father's field, and he, he looked at who he was, and he wasn't ashamed of it, even in the struggle. He, he embraced who he was, he embraced his past, even the difficult stuff. He was confident in the person that he was. He knew he was shorter, he knew he was younger. It wasn't like a shock to him. It was like, wait, I'm, I'm not as big as you? I mean, you can kind of kind of see the difference. That's not like a complete shock. But it didn't stop him. It didn't stop him that he was untrained in the art of war. Because he was confident in, in the person that he was. And then we see, too, that he walks in his potential. What does that mean? There's, there's a, a potential to do certain things put in his life. And the potential at that point was not going to be to be a great sword-wielding soldier. He'd never held a sword before. He'd never done that before. But the potential that he had, what was in his hand, was the ability to sling a rock like nobody else. I mean, that was the potential that was put in, put in me. He's like, no, I, I haven't killed that guy, but, I, but I've killed a lion and a bear. I, I, I've beat him with a club, and I've shot things with a rock. You know, so I'm good. He knew what was put in him, and he walked in what he knew he had, with the gifts in his hands, with the abilities at his disposal, it wasn't less than what they had, it was what he had. And so he walked in it. Here, I think that we would have tried to take the sword, even if we'd never used one before, and trying to go out there and act like we're like a ninja warrior. That, that, would, be, that would be me, because that was the socially acceptable, that's what it's supposed to look like, but he knew who he was. But it wasn't the soldier who was destined to be Goliath, it was the shepherd boy. And if he would have tried to be the soldier, we wouldn't read the stories that we have today. Think about your own, your own life and your own self in the context of how David responded. Think, think about your own life. How does your past affect you? Like today, as you, as you look back over the, the, the past of your life, is it really a series of events that you're trying to cover up, not talk about, just trying to, to I just want to move past that. And, or, or, or is there something maybe you're not even proud of? It's not a past that, that's even great, but I can embrace that because no matter what happened, it made me who I am today, and who I am today, God can use for tomorrow. God can use. You've got to come to a point where you can embrace even the tough stuff because you realize that God is in all of it if we'll give it to him? How do we respond to our past? What are your thoughts of you? What are your thoughts of you? You don't have to say it out, but when you really think about it, and if you got alone and just kind of journaled this out, and you thought about it, what are your thoughts of you? And sometimes those are very difficult. 
to come to grips with. My thoughts of me really aren't that great. But see, he embraced who he was. The good stuff that he thought, the bad stuff, all of it, the short, the tall, who, it was who he was. So he was confident in that. And, and what, what, what's put in your hands? Maybe you're like, I don't have as much money, I don't have, as, I don't have this, I don't have that. We're always looking at what we don't have. We're living our life based on our don't instead of our do. We're basing our, our life off of our lack instead of our have. It's not like I'm going to one day, I'm going to strive to get that, and then whenever I get to be the good soldier, then I'll go fight the battle. Now, David said, I see what I have right now, and that's what I need right here today. And, and, and he didn't see the lack. He saw exactly what he needed because God had already put it in his hands. See, one of my biggest doubts is being transparent. And this isn't something that I say every day or some kind of conscious thought that I have. But if I'm real honest about myself, one of my biggest doubts about God is that he didn't mess up on me. I can believe God for all kinds of stuff. I can believe God for your healing. I can believe God to start a church. But when you get really honest, I see me every day. I've got to say, God, I know you don't mess up, but did, was there, did you mess up on me? I don't know if you've ever struggled with that thought before. You've struggled with thinking, I mean, other people look better, they talk better, they're more intelligent, they have more stuff, they're, they're born into different families. I mean, did you really create me the way that you meant to? And, and, and that thought is completely false, but that's the first one that comes into my mind. Not doubt that God can do something for you, but doubt that he can really use me and do something in me. See, but we also, also see, as we're going to kind of finish up this thought here, but it wasn't David's great self-awareness that gave him the confidence and the strength to defeat the giant. He, he didn't just have a class on, um, you know, behavioral modification, and then everything was different. There was something more. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, 41 through 47, we kind of see another part of the story here. It says, Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. He said, I am, a, am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the name of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. At that point, I've used the bathroom a little bit and I'm running away. I'm done. It's over. Because really, you've got a nine-foot guy with a, with a guy carrying his stuff and then he's carrying a sword that weighs as much as me and he's yelling threats. I'm done. But David replied to the Philistine. He had confidence. Did you come at me with a sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today, here, here's, a, here's a key verse that we have to, have to see. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I'll cut off your head. God's going to beat you, but I'm going to hold the sword at the end of the day. And then I will give... He, gets, he really throwing some threats back. I mean, you don't mess with David. And then I'll give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. And everyone who will assemble here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. The Lord, this is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. David wouldn't put a filter on who he was. He wouldn't cover up and try to be something that he, that he wasn't because he embraced who he was because he knew the one who created him. See, here's what the scripture says. The scripture says that you are created in the image of something. You're not created in the image of someone else. You're not created in the image of some inanimate object. We are literally created in the image of God. God himself who created everything created you. The mountains that we love, the sunset that's so beautiful that we can hashtag no filter, it wasn't created in his image. It was created by his hands, but not in his image. Us, the one thing that we see with, as the major flaw is the one thing that was created in the image of God Almighty. You are an image bearer for God. So David's real self-awareness was being aware of his self 
as being in the image of God. He, he, he could embrace his past. He could be confident in the person that he was. And he could walk out in his potential because he knows it's not about him anyways. That God created me and God doesn't mess up. Therefore, i.e., it's going to be okay. Hashtag we got this. Because hashtag God don't mess up. And believe it or not, I may be short, I may be ruddy, I may just take care of stinky sheep, I may not smell as good as you, I may, but you know what, I may just know how to throw a stone, but God made me. Yeah, not the same way as you, and that's okay, because God's made me to do something that you were never created for. And God made you to do something I was never created for. And we're both going to do something incredible for God, through God, with God. Who I am is simply a reflection. I mean, Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. He says, now, currently, today, as we're speaking, as this is being written, as we're in this room, we see things imperfectly. Like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. Then, one day, whenever we're face to face with God, when we are with him. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Who knows me completely? God. God knows me completely. Here's what's happened. The world that we live in, this this sin-tainted world, creates a filter on the image of God that we see reflected back at us. So when we look at us, we don't see the clear filter. We don't see the, the clear the clear person that we're created to be we're seeing a distorted imperfect image back and because we don't see the image that God created coming back at us we think that we have to do something to make up the difference and to be a better version of who we are to be something else I'm not saying don't ever strive to be more but we're striving to be more at the cost and at the sake of not being you because we don't see ourselves clearly. Honestly, a boy with a rock is not that impressive. Honestly, if you look at my life, it's not that impressive. And if we look at yours, maybe you'll blow us all away. But maybe you think, ah, I know everything in here. I'm not impressed with some of these things. But what, what did David do? And, and I, I think we know this because we can read the next verse right after 1 Corinthians 13, 12. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says this. Right after he said, hey, God knows me completely. Right now I see everything imperfectly. He said, these, there's three things that's going to last forever. There's faith, there's hope, and there's love. The greatest of these is love. See, before David's confidence was tested, he was preparing himself daily. He was preparing himself every single day before the battle began. See, because of, love, because of David's love for God, you can read in the book of Psalms, it's not like one day he just decided that I'm going to go out here and just say, God, you got this. Every single day we see pinned down where he's, he's talking to God, where he's reflecting about God's goodness, where he's having God moments. He's experiencing God as he's walking the sheep, as he's fighting the lion. He's, he's having God experiences and God moments, and he's looking for God in every single moment. And he's thanking God for the good, for the bad. And you can read through Psalms that even as a shepherd boy, he's, he, he is dedicated to preparing himself to knowing who God is. The greatest three things that we've got to know that, Dave, that David walked in is faith, hope, and love. Because of his love for God, he had hope that God was molding something in his future just as he did in his past, and he had the faith to step out and to fight a giant. See, but a lot of us, if I were to ask you, um, are you confident in you, we'd say no. And here's the real reason we're not confident in us because ultimately we're not confident in him. We're not confident in me, not that I can do anything because I don't have confidence really in him. Because if I did, I would realize that he hasn't messed up and he's doing something with me. I don't have to be something that I'm not. 
So the first thing that I want to, that I want to ask you, and that I want to create some clarity on, just like David did daily, he was experiencing the love of God every day. Are you experiencing God's love? And I'm not talking about some kind of euphoric, like, you know, I just got goosebumps and, 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 you know, I just got butterflies in my tummy because, you know, God made me feel so good. I mean, yeah, there are those moments in God's presence where you, you do feel that emotional connection, but the love of God is so much bigger. God is himself love. God, because of love, sent his son Jesus to prepare a way for us to be with him. So love is so much more than just a fleeting feeling. To experience God is to experience his love. So I want to ask you, how many God experiences do you have in your life every week? Is Sunday morning it? If, and I want to say, if it's just Sundays, then you don't know God enough to have the confidence in him to see you reflected back. You don't know him enough. I want to create God experiences, God moments as often as I can. Because whenever I experience him, I'm experiencing his love. David wrote the psalm so we can see clearly he did this all the time. And I don't know what it looks like for you. Maybe it's meditating on, on the scripture. Maybe it's listening to music. Maybe it's just reflecting on his goodness for a while. But how often do you pull back and you say, I'm going to ha- create some God experiences. Not just for his blessings. Here, here, here's the key. I don't just... God, I don't just seek you and I don't just say I love you because you've done something for me. That's not real love. I mean, if, if I just love my wife because of something that she did or could do or some ability she had, if that went away, so would my feelings for her. But there's something bigger. God, I need to experience you every day. Because the more that I experience him, the more my hope the more there is my hope that he redeems my past, that he directs my future, and it gives me the faith to step out today. How many God experiences are you having? David didn't wait till the battle to figure out who he was. He had been preparing himself daily by spending time with the one who know, knew him completely. The more I experience him, the more... That my hope redeems my past. Some of us were so struggling with our past. You need hope. Experience through his love. David had a deep-rooted faith, hope, and love in him. So he was confident that God didn't mess up. And just like, just like in the scripture where David said, Wait, God's going to win today, but I'm cutting your head off. God wins, but he uses you. He uses me. And, and, and he, just like I'm fully confident he didn't mess up on you, just like I have full confidence that God has put certain things inside of you that he didn't put in me to only accomplish the destiny that he has for you. Just that I'm so confident in that I have to walk in my own confidence that God didn't mess up on me. And the only way that I can walk in that confidence is to know the one who knows me completely. Because then only then am I continually wiping off the junk that the world puts on the image that I see of myself. I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. I want to walk in who it is that I am. The last part of that scripture, is if you stand up with me. The scripture only ends the way that we see it. It's become, because David was just completely unfiltered before God. God, you have my past. You have my present. You have my future. Because I'm only who you've created me to be anyways. God wants you. Not just some version of you that you wish you were. Not something that maybe he wishes that you would be, then you can come to him. He, he wants you. First Samuel 17, 48-51, it says, As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran to meet him. Didn't back down. 
reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's own sword. That's brutal, man. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. I mean, that shouldn't have happened this way. They should have lost. But it took one shepherd boy, confident in who who he was, because he knew the one who created him. And it changed the entire outcome. I don't have to lie about hashtag no filter and be something that I'm not. Take a picture of me and try to get it in the right light and just just look perfect. And then be like, that's how I always look. No. Sometimes I wake up with snot covering my face and my beard's crooked and all kind of ugly stuff. That's still who I am and it's still who God uses. Even on my worst day, God's still his best and he still didn't mess up. Because, you know what? Hashtag, God doesn't mess up. This is who I am. Now, it's not the way that God wants to always leave me. But if I give this to God right now, he will create in me who I'm destined to be, not just who I'm trying to be. It's only when you embrace who he's made you to be that you can become who you're destined to be. Hashtag no filter. Let's pray. Father, I lift you up, God. God, and I repent, and I'm sorry for not being confident in the person that you created. Not walking out and... and, and living out what you've told me to do because I don't have confidence in me and I know in reality it's because I don't have confidence in you. So God, forgive me. Help me to see you more clearly. Help me to know what you're doing and you're working. But God, even if I don't see all the steps, God, I trust in you. God, so I believe you didn't mess up on me. God, and I pray for encouragement over people today. Maybe that have lived their lives just so unsatisfied with who they are, trying to cover up or not be or try to live in something that they're not. God, I pray that you just realize you didn't mess up on them. You've never messed up. You didn't start them. You have something for them, but only if unfiltered we come before you and just give you all of us. So God, this morning, I just say, take me, take my life. If your eyes are closed, I just want to ask you a question. Um, one of them is maybe you've never given your life to Jesus before. And I can tell you right there, if you don't know him, you really can't know the real you. And today, you, you just need to have a fresh start in him. It's as simple as a prayer away. Jesus did the hard work. He came to this earth. He lived and he died all with us on his mind because he loves us. Because of love. To start experiencing that love, it's, just, it's as simple as asking him to come into your life. If you say that's you and you just you want to say a simple prayer with me today, I'm not going to call you out or do anything weird. We're going to, we'll, 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 we'll do it all together. I just want to pray over you. If you'd slip your hand up, you say, I just need that fresh start today. All right. Next one is this. Maybe, maybe you just... Your, your real issue in life, and maybe you hadn't thought about it a whole lot, but man, you just see your real issue is confidence that in, in you. You say, God, help me to see you more clearly so I can know that you didn't mess up on me. If you just need to pray over you for that, would you slip your hand up? All right, I see a bunch of hands. Father, you know what we're going through, but God, also help us to walk in the confidence that you didn't mess up. God, there's such power in not trying to live a filtered life through something that we're not and just walking in who we are with you. God, I pray for the people that put their hands up for salvation this morning. That God, as I'm praying right now, they'll begin to say their own simple words. Say, God, forgive me. I know you sent your son to die on a cross. I give my life to you. Make me new. And instantly, we're created new in your sight. We're on a new path. Father, I thank you for today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's sermon at City Church. We are passionate about seeing people lead full lives in Christ. 
and we truly hope that you've been impacted today by God's Word. If there's anything that we can do for you, or you would like to share with us what God has spoken to you today through this message, please email us at info at citychurchlufkin.com. Or for more information about who we are, visit us online at citychurchlufkin.com.